So we're going to talk about prayer a little bit today, but um, also the power of being formed and, and made in God's image and uh, having his spirit living on the inside of us. That's really what I hope the revelation will be the most today. We say Holy Spirit, we sang Holy Ghost a little bit earlier today, and we have to have a name for that part of the Godhead. But it's a very complex presence in our lives that, that could be described by a lot of names, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. But recognize what I've been starting to say is that it's the spirit of God's divine nature lives on the inside of us. And that's a really profound thought. So let's just pray for a second here and ask the Lord to, to make that real to us. Father, as we open up your word this morning, help us recognize that it's not a ghost, that your presence in us is not a ghost. It's not spooky or mystical uh, other than to know that it's your power and presence living on the inside of us. And Holy Spirit, help us recognize that you are the very nature of God living on the inside of us. And, and we repent when we have forgotten or through our pride or our arrogance just refused to invite you in to the decisions that we were making. And we say, come Lord in your power. Come Lord in your presence in my life, in this region, in America, in the world, because we need you. We can't get it done in our own strength. So even now, Lord, as we break the bread of life and we open up your word, feed us that food that will give us the nourishment that we need in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to go quickly through some of these slides. That was the, the graphic that we used this week to talk about what we were talking about today. And Psalm 139.14, many of you know, is when it says, I praise the Lord because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's a really profound truth that surfaced over all the years that we started doing Elijah House 20 plus years ago, which we now call Possessing Your Vessel. If you want to look at that information, it's on our website. It's uh, actually really on our YouTube channel. There's a playlist of 19 different uh, teachings about that. And over and over again, that theme that we are fearfully and wonderfully made kept surfacing in the different teachings that we talked about. And why we can't judge people. Because they're made in God's image too. And it's really hard in America, or I'm sure in other places, to not judge people when we look at them because we do it almost involuntarily. We, we form assumptions in our brain. We fill in blanks because we think we know and, and we so discredit God. We say things like, oh, they'll never change. If you believe in God, you can never say that because God could change anybody, all right? Looking at one right here. Don't ever say they'll never change, okay? Because that's not true. When God is in it, there is no limit. <laughs> But one of the challenges, I'll just see if we're tracking here. Yeah, it looks like you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. is from Proverbs, and this is part of the burden on us as the body of Christ is what is our role. It says, God conceals the revelation of his word in the hiding place of his glory. That's a great way to say it, isn't it? That's a passion translation from Proverbs 25 too. I'm going to read it again. God conceals the revelation of his word in the hiding place of his glory. So when you get into his glory, you're spending time with him and you're seeking his presence and he sees your heart has been humbled and you recognize, I don't want to leave this altar until I hear from you today. Because I've learned what happens when I go out under my own strength. Again, I don't end up in jail per se, but I sure don't end up in the glory realm that you want me to be in. Because it's in the glory realm that you reveal the revelation, not just of what your word means, but how I should apply it in this situation. And that this situation is a thousand times a day, isn't it? In our complicated lives that we live. Growing up on the farm, Easter didn't have as much interaction with all the things that we have to do now. Life's a lot more complicated. God doesn't care. He's bigger than that. Amen. He'll be in every single decision you ask him to be. Amen. But he doesn't force himself in. All right, so that's his part. That's the truth that he reveals it in the hiding place of his glory. But the honor of kings, and look at somebody and say, you're a king. All right. And you're a priest. That's what the Bible says about us. Chosen generation, royal priesthood. I won't call you the peculiar people. 
only peculiar in that we operate on a different kingdom. We're in the world, but we're of the kingdom of God while we're in the world, right? The honor of kings, that's us, is revealed by how thoroughly, I'm sorry, how they thoroughly search out the deeper meaning of all that God says. And that's a real good mission statement for Christians, isn't it? That we should be thoroughly searching out the deeper meanings of everything that God says, not just to understand the theory, but to know how to translate that into everyday life and every interaction that we have. And you can be respectful to everybody, even when you don't agree with them. But it's not easy, is it? Not easy. Neither is forgiving people, but God helps us do it, doesn't he? It's supernatural that you're able to forgive people. Watch the uh, less than an hour video by Joyce Meyer called One Life, and you'll learn about the supernatural power of forgiveness. And I quoted Psalm 139, 14 already. I am fearfully, wonderfully made, but what I'm doing with you today is trying to say that part of the assignment is to take what's written in Proverbs 25. God reveals that revelation only comes when we're in that hiding place of his glory, and it's our job to translate that into the way we interact with everybody that we meet. And never give up hope on anybody. That doesn't mean necessarily that you have to keep inviting them over to dinner either, right? You're not looking past everything they're doing. Sometimes tough love requires you to say, this is the requirement in order for us to continue. That is loving them. Candy coating things and saying, oh no, you didn't hurt my feelings, it's okay. Yes, they did hurt your feelings, say it. You got the spirit of truth living inside of you, but just say it with love. And you might have to ask, I don't know how to do that, God, but... Works real good in a marriage. Amen. Ask first. <laughs> and then this is uh, Hebrews 1, 3 in two different translations because there's key words here. and It talks about the Spirit of God having so many different dimensions. And that's how you should think of it. If you've ever seen a diamond up close and you change it in the light, there's so many dimensions of the way the light refracts off of that diamond, right? And that's how each person is. But the woundings that we experience in life are just brutal. And, and they, they cover over a lot of that glow of the diamond. But God still sees it in there behind all the pain and behind all the structure that gets put up to protect us. God still sees the light on the inside. And he says the sun, Jesus, is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor, the exact expression of God's true nature, his mirror image. When you look at me, Jesus said, you've seen the Father. Now, most people in the culture would not make that connection. In one of our Bible studies, we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, and, and the person moderating the talk said, when you think of a genius, who's the first person that comes to your mind? And everybody put their word in. Einstein's usually the first one that most people think of. What about Jesus? He was the smartest person who ever lived. But somehow he's been made out in the movies and in all the ways we think of him as, as some kind of spiritual spooky guy that said things that people didn't understand. No, see, you've got to dig in. You've got to get in that hiding place of glory and the Lord will reveal it to you. Amen. And then he will show you how to apply it in the lives of the people that you're interacting with. Every one of them, every person you interact with is a gem to the Lord because they were made in his image. It's really hard. Well, this teaching in, in the uh, class that we run, the possessing your vessel, bitter root judgments, uh, those of you that remember that one, it's very difficult. We, we make inner vows. We have bad things happen to us, and we make statements in the inside of our spirit, and we say, I will never let that happen again. I will never be like my father. I will never be like my mother. I will never trust a man or a woman, however you got hurt. Well, guess what? You become the very thing you say you'll never be by the power of sowing and reaping because you defiled something that God holds in high value, and many times we have to repent of our judgments against people. All right, that's a different day's teaching. But if Jesus is the, it says the exact expression of God's true nature, and Holy Spirit is his nature inside of us, right? And it even says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. So this is not a ghost. 
Holy Ghost, that's one of the translations. The spiritual aspect of it is powerful, but the exact expression was in Jesus. Part of that is in you. So he wants us to be exact expressions of his nature. It's amazing, isn't it, that this God that has no limits puts himself in a limited structure and empowers us to do things that are supernatural. Let your kingdom come today, Lord. Let your will be done here on earth through my life as it is in heaven. And then the other way it's written in New English translation says the sun is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence. I love that word essence. The picture I got is when you boil, if you're a chef and you boil down everything in the pot, the essence is what's left, right? You strip away all the outside stuff. I heard somebody describe a marathon like that. A marathon, when you're in that 17th mile and you're just about to die of a heart attack, you think, right? You haven't caught your second wind yet and you're stripped of everything you thought was important and this is the real you that's left now. That's Jesus on the cross. Everything else has been stripped away and he's only got a few minutes left and he says, Father, forgive them. That's the essence of who he is. He was human. He could have sinned. Could have held resentment and bitterness. No, the essence of who he is is forgive them. They know not what they do. Oh, that's in us. And he said in the last days, I will pour my spirit on all flesh. That's worth thinking about. Because that person who's yelling at you and raging at you, I think you might have heard me say in, in New York City one time, I was on the elevator, and this guy got in, in the elevator. He was having a really bad day. And it was an older guy. I think it was in a medical building, and he had gone to the doctor, and he was like, yeah, you stupid, burp, burp. you know, like he was just having a bad day. And he was a little shorter than me, and he looked up at me. He goes, Man, he was just giving me a hard time. I never met him. He was on the elevator. The door's open, and this guy walks in. You know, and you want to think, like, he's demon-possessed, but I just got compassion for him. That's what the Lord will do. And I just smiled at him. I tried anyway. I smiled at him and said, man, it looks like you're having a really bad day. Can I pray for you? <laughs> and it just disarms that thing. Because that's not what they're expecting, right? They're expecting to be iron and iron going against each other. Mm -mm. The Holy Spirit works in us in every transaction if we ask him to. Ha! So... He's the exact expression of God's essence living inside of me. So I could ask my wife at the end of the day, how did I express his essence in my behavior to you? And she could say, well, how much time do you have? <laughs> she took notes. Part of it is giving the person permission to speak into your life and not get defensive about it, right? One of the best things you could have somebody do for you. Speak truth into your life. So here's some of the different words. Holy Spirit, the exact expression and essence of God. Pneuma. It's breath. That's a hot topic these last, what, 14 months? Breath. <laughs> the breath of God. That's what so resonated with me when you gave that word earlier today during prayer. When it's essential. The breath is essential or you can't live. And the, the breath of God in your conversations is essential or your relationships won't live. Because you'll say things out of that carnal side of your nature, that fleshly side of your nature. And you can only control your half of the equation. You can't control what the other people do or say to you, but you sure can control what you say and what you do. And Kathy came up and gave a word that she got. Was it in a dream, I think you said, right? About essential coming in the car so it was more of a vision and uh boy that's so true every person is essential all right even if they are on the wrong party political party or it's a family member giving you a hard time about something what we're gonna have to do is give an account someday for how we treated them and then if they didn't respond to what we did that's one thing but if we didn't even try then God would say you know I thought you said you valued these people. If every person is made in the image of God, then they could express my essence too. But you gave up on them. 
And I'm not putting a guilt trip on anybody. I'm saying this really matters to God. We have to love what he loves, and he loves people more than anything because we're the only thing made in his image and filled with his spirit. And why we talk about this on the Sanctity of Life Day is because that birthing process is a miracle. And we're the only ones that can birth new creation in God's image. So no wonder the devil wants to wipe it out. No wonder people are committing suicide. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God came to give us life abundantly. Life, eternal life. You can experience the eternal life now because you're, you're inviting the essence of God's presence into your life. You're a partaker of the divine nature when you're a Christian. But if you don't access it, if you're not intentional, which would include prayer for sure, and say, Lord, I recognize I'm on my knees because I recognize in my strength it's not going to turn out well today. Even though I'm a Christian, there's still a deceitful part of my heart that will try to creep in. So I'm going to be intentional, Lord, to do it your way today. So, breath. These are different definitions of pneuma. Vital force, soul, spirit, holy. And then in the Hebrew language, it's ruach or ruach. And that's breath or spirit or wind. And I like this last one, courage. Because we talked about Dr. King having courage. If you ever get a chance, watch The Long Road to Freedom. Uh, and it's free on YouTube about Dr. King before the march in Selma. All the things leading up to it, all the rides on the buses through all those cities. It's unbelievable how brave these people were, knowing that they were riding into a city where there, there's going to be people waiting with baseball bats and German shepherds, and that they weren't going to fight back so they could catch it on film and show the world what was going on before the days when everybody had a phone in their pocket. And the most famous interaction was because they recognized he was the biggest racist of all in the South. I can't remember the full name. His first name was Bull, I think. Bull Connor. Bull Connor. You're going right into the belly of the beast, knowing you're not going to fight back. And guess who the most courageous people on their whole team was? The teenagers. And this is what they said. You all have families. We're just getting started out. We have less to lose than you do and more to gain if we win. And here's these teenagers, 90 pounds, walking in the front of the line. That's who the dogs were getting first. That's who was getting hosed. That's who was getting beaten. These kids and going to the next town and doing it again. I'm telling you, that's Holy Spirit. We don't always relate it that way, but that's one of the definitions. It's the spirit in a person. That's our character. That's our backbone. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, right? Double backbone. You could be Marcus Luttrell or you could be Desmond Toss. They're both courageous. Sometimes you fight, sometimes you don't. They both work. And this is what Rahab said in Joshua chapter 2. She said, I know the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us. Our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone. The spirit was drained out of the people because of the power of God operating in their midst. We have to operate in the power of that courage. And I'm going to tell you, more now than ever in America, in, in my lifetime anyway, because there's a... There's a real hatred in the air right now that's swirling around us. And we're the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. There might be some persecution. That's okay. The church has prospered through persecution throughout history. There's no such thing as a free pass in life, right? There isn't. We'll talk about that another day, too. I just want to hit a couple of scriptures. This is what I already quoted his partakers of his divine nature. It says, everything we could ever need for life and complete devotion to God has already been deposited in us by the, his divine power, okay? That's Holy Spirit. Everything you need for life is already in you. He's given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price. You can experience partnership with the divine nature. He doesn't just automatically force his way in. He comes where he's welcome. So welcome him in. 
every minute of every day, welcome him into your life because he'll help you do better than you would do on your own. Why wouldn't we pray? Why wouldn't we ask for his advice? He's not going to give you bad advice. But your flesh will tell you, you should eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Even though God told you not to because he's trying to hold something back. And people are still doing this today. No matter what the statistics say, I'm going to try living together with the person before I get married. The, 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 it's got nothing to do with whether they're Christians or not. All the studies say it doesn't work. Make a commitment. And ladies, can I just say to you, you're worried about a lack of commitment from the man, but if you're living with him, why should he make a commitment? Say la. And the dads of these girls should be meeting the guy with a shotgun on the porch. You know, that's John Price's story, right? First time he met Cheryl's father, he went over to the house and Cheryl's father walked out onto the porch and he showed John a shotgun shell with his name on it. It said, John Price. <laughs> this is what's gonna happen to you if you mess with my daughter. And then he picked up the father by the ankles and, and the scruff of his jacket and he lifted him up over his head. It's the first time he met him. And he said, well, you better not miss because if you miss me, I'll kill you. Put him back down on the porch and then the father walked back in the house. And, and said to the mom, Cheryl's got a new boyfriend and I really like him. <laughs> so that, they did stuff different down in the Pine Barrens than they do up here. <laughs> Jesus is right. So let me just build a little bridge here for you because this is how the Lord showed it to me. Jesus was the exact expression, right? And Spirit of God is the essence of the Father. Boil down everything living inside of you. What a dispensation that we're in, that Holy Spirit is living inside of us, and that we're on this side of Pentecost, meaning, you know, the Pentecostal movement really started in Los Angeles on Azusa Street in 1906, and it hasn't slowed down yet. It's amazing. So the exact expression and the representation of his essence. How well, I already said it, do I express his essence? This is something we could be looking at every day. This is what God asks us to do, to examine ourselves. And then it goes to the anointing is expressence. <laughs> it's a new word. It combines those two things together. And it's like IQ and EQ. You know, IQ is intelligence, but EQ is the way you apply it, how well you handle things. That's what it's meant to be anyway. And that's what this is. It's like an ability to translate what the Lord is saying to us into every situation. And I found the more I asked, the better I got at it. Because I lived a long part of my life without even asking. And just thinking I knew. But why not just pause and hesitate and wait? And then I could be the expressance. <laughs> you can decide whether you like that word. For me, it means a whole lot. What's that factor in my life? How well did I know what he wanted to do and how well did I be what he wanted me to be, that's this translation process, that you can speak the truth to somebody and do it in love. All right, you good? And then I said, the anointing is expressing no prayer, no anointing. Peter's life, you guys decide whether you believe that or not. And then this is the picture that he gave me, because it's the Sanctity of Life Sunday. And it's this picture of a mom being pregnant and then that image of what da Vinci drew as humanity, right? The, the picture of a, of a person who's made in God's image is being released fearfully and wonderfully made, right? Psalm 139, 14. It's being released into the earth. This person, this amazing creation in the image of God is being released into the earth. And what happens to that child is partly due to how we receive that child corporately, how we receive that child. And one of the reasons this country was started is so that people could have a fair shot. We hold this truth to be self-evident that every person is created equal. No caste system like there was in India. Everybody here is going to get a shot. Everybody here is going to be presumed innocent until you can prove them guilty. And that's a great thing, but nobody else had done that before. Amazing heritage we have. Some bad stuff, of course. Of 
Of course. Nobody had ever even tried this experiment before. I'm going to go off on that tangent. But here's this little baby that I, I'm guessing the one on the, on the top there, 30 weeks, premature, would have died 50 years ago. But today they can keep these children alive so much longer. And why abortion should just be so important in your mind on this Sanctity of Life Sunday. And that we, we have allowed it to become such a common thing in the American culture that we don't even talk about it anymore. It's just like a given. It's not okay. It's not okay. Not in this church anyway. There might be other churches that say they're pro-choice. I just don't know how you could ever match this up with that opinion. They're, they're defending late-term abortions or even post-birth, let the baby die. I'll tell you, that, that's going to bring a really bad outcome if we don't do something about it. We can't say we didn't try. That, that's the bottom line. Whether we change it or not, that's one thing. But, you know, William Wilberforce is famous for what he did in England to stop the slave trade. On paper, impossible for one guy to make that much of a difference. Read the book, Amazing Grace. He made the difference. Eric Metaxas wrote the book. Powerful what one person can do. So you might think, well, what can I do against that? What you can do is pray. And wherever two are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I'm there with you. And if one puts 1,000 and two put 10,000, there's 400,000 people going on to the, give me 15, give them 15 prayer from Dutch Sheets every day. So if you think we should have been praying for America before the election, we need to be praying even more now. Just stick with abortion. But you could change that conversation to the curriculum for our kids in school. Telling us there's no difference between a boy and a girl. And the kid gets to just pick whatever they want. And if you don't agree as parents, we can come and take your child. That's why we have guns. <laughs> You're just going to let somebody take your child? Six-year-old kid that is confused about being a boy or a girl? You planted the seed in his brain to confuse him about it in the first place. No, not okay. Not on our watch, church, right? Not on our watch. I'm going to finish in Romans, just a couple verses. Thank you. Romans 8, 9. <laughs> the expressance of God's nature. I'm going to try to say it a few times so you get used to this word. The spirit in us is guiding us, but if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to God and is not a child of God. So your first identity is child of God, yeah. right? If somebody says, who are you? You say, I'm a child of the living God, son or daughter of the living God. That's first, not Italian or whoever else you might be by ethnic or whatever else you do. Sometimes people say, I'm an accountant. Well, no, you're not an accountant. That's what you do. That's not who you are, right? I'm a child of God. First answer. That's who you are first, primary. <laughs> if Christ lives in you, though your natural body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he provides. Mm. I like that. Did I jump ahead? I think I might have jumped already. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to seven. The mind of the flesh with its sinful pursuits. There it is. Good is actively hostile to God. So can I just make a commercial when you're talking to unsafe people, they don't have awareness of the Holy Spirit? So this was me, the mind of my flesh, with its sinful pursuits, I was actively hostile to God before I became a Christian because I wanted to fulfill the lusts of my flesh. I didn't know there was any other option. Everybody I look up to, that's what they did, and I wanted to be good at what they did. I was just following the wrong leader. I didn't know about the Lord. So this is who you're speaking to when you're talking to an unsafe person. That, that person doesn't submit itself to God's law and can't until they say yes to Jesus. And those who are in the flesh living the life that caters to that sinful appetite cannot please God. However, you are not living in the flesh. <laughs> say that with me, okay? I am not. Not living in the flesh. Mm. 
Thank you, Lord. I'm not controlled by that sinful nature, but I'm living in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit lives in me. How much better is that? Oh, much better. Thank you, Dave. And what's he doing? He's directing you and guiding you. But if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to you. You don't belong to the Lord, and you're not a child of God. But if Christ lives in you, though your natural body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he provides. Oh, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. As a yielded vessel to the Lord, he fills you with his spirit. Then you take the time and you burn the word in. Worship music, whatever ways you can get it in, audio books. There's so many ways that you can be listening to the word, get it in your spirit in the course of your day. It'll help keep you calm. I'm getting a little riled up up here. <laughs> this is one of my favorite verses. Well, I think of it all the time. He, Romans 8, 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. Yeah. This, yeah. this is going to get resurrected someday in a new form. Hallelujah. <laughs> but while we're here, that spirit lives inside of us. And verse 12 says, so then, brethren and brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but the obligation is not to our flesh. That human nature, that worldliness, that sinful capacity that still tries to resurrect inside of us, even though we're Christians. That's why it's called warfare, because there's this competing going on for our attention. Sure, I can eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God's just being stingy. Yeah, how silly is that? No, no, I've learned. I can trust him. How about you? This has got all the answers, but i got to dig in to find them. And I've got to have friends around me that are modeling this for me because they encourage me and we strengthen each other because we're living in a family of other believers that keep, you know, I love that one where it says that we spur one another on to love and good works. Spur, that's what a cowboy uses to get the horse to move. We spur one another on. Hey, what are you doing, Dave? Snap out of it. Trish likes that line in that movie. Remember that? Moonstruck? Snap out of it. Five-fold ministry. <laughs> and if the spirit of him, oh God, can we stand for this one? This is just so holy to me, this verse. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. That should make you really happy. Say something, noise, make some noise about it. That's something to celebrate. That's really good news same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in me. Yeah. Am I accessing it? Well, that's on my side of the equation. Am I tapping into it? Am I asking him to help me? Well, if I'm not, he's not going to just be rude. He comes where he's welcomed. If that spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, that he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit. See, so if we're struggling with an addiction, we can ask him to help us, and that weakness of our flesh, pornography, gambling, whatever it is, there's a million different things it could be, right? No, no, but the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in me, and he'll give me strength that I don't have in my own natural ability. And then it'll also give you the power to pray for other people to help them when they don't have the strength. And look, you know, somebody, you don't know Tara's story, and I won't tell the whole story, other than this is a devastating loss for her. And we're the church. She lost her father. She had already lost her mother many years ago. That's a hard spot to be, isn't it? And she's been a mom extraordinaire. But dad, you only get one dad. You only get one mom. So pray for her. That's what we're here for, to help each other. Because that spirit of life in you can come along somebody who's down about something and it can be contagious to them. And all of a sudden they get hope. And if we're not doing that, then boy, there's plenty of room for us to, to get involved because there's plenty of hurting people in the world. <laughs> all right, almost done. So then brothers and sisters, we have an obligation not to our flesh or our human nature or to our worldliness and sinful capacity, but 
We're not going to live according to the impulses of that flesh, that nature that's without the Holy Spirit. If you're living according to that, you're going to die. But if you're living by the power of the Holy Spirit, oh, don't bail on me now. You're not bailing on me now. You are habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body, and you really will live forever. Come on, let's just put our hands up. <laughs> Say, I am living by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I am habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body, and I will live forever. Oh, boy, if you're wondering about good news, that's really good news. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come in a fresh way. We invite you to be a major part of our lives, a, a, a part of the Godhead that, that we have kind of put on the back shelf. But we say, no, we want to submit to you. We're asking you to put us in the training school of life, that as we get in that hidden place, the glory will be revealed, and you'll show us how to translate that into every part of our lives. And if you don't know the Lord, you might be here today, you might be watching online, and this is all new to you, you didn't realize this is part of it, that you should just say yes to Jesus right now. Shouldn't they, church? I mean, was it the best decision you ever made? I'm telling you, it was the best decision I ever made, and I tried a bunch of other ones. And it's just as simple as inviting him into your heart and say it. We'll say it out loud together. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I recognize there's sin in my life, and I can't save myself, but I need a Savior. I turn to you, Lord, for your forgiveness, for your love, and for the power of your word, the truth of your word, and the power of your spirit, your divine essence living inside of me. I want to be a child of God, adopted into your family, repent of my sins and accept you as my Lord and Savior today. In Jesus' name, amen. It's really that easy. I remember one guy pounding his fist on the table saying, it can't be that easy. And the reason he did it is because he was upset about somebody that had done him wrong and he didn't want to have to forgive that person. And right away he knew, if I say yes to this, it's going to change my life. Well, let me tell you, church, there's a bunch of people here that would val validate what I'm about to say. You don't have the power in your own strength to do it, but God will give you all the power you need to cover every situation in your life. You just have to trust Him by faith. Your life will be completely transformed. And if you're here in the building and you haven't ever said yes to the Lord and you said yes and you prayed with us today, come down to the altar right now. Just come down and stand at the altar so we can give you a Bible, we can pray with you, and, and you can be part of that family. And the church, if you're not bringing an unbeliever to church, start bringing some of your friends that don't know the Lord. And let's believe God for the miraculous, amen? That he will touch them. We're talking to a guy these days that got saved in our, in our cafe. He was hardened to the Lord. And... He had a, a shoulder injury, and a friend of his just kept inviting him to come. And she said, come on, let's just go get a cup of coffee at the cafe. And we had the healing rooms going on that day. So she brought him into the back. When the guy laid hands on him for prayer, this kid went out under the power of God and didn't even know what that was. <laughs> he got up healed, accepted the Lord, and now he's working full time in ministry. I'm telling you. And she was probably looked at as like a pain in the neck. Leave me alone, lady. All right, I'll go get a cup of coffee with you just to get you off my back. Well, the hound of heaven is the Holy Spirit. So you be people that are introducing this to your friends and saying, hey, if you're hurting, come on, they'll pray for you. Right? Let's be that, church. So Lord, I bless your people as we go out today. We're not going out powerless people. We're going out filled with that divine nature living on the inside of us. Help us, Lord to express your essence in everything that we do and each day to keep growing in this ability in Jesus' name. Y'all have an awesome day, awesome week. Love you. See you soon.